My name is Jacob Bryce with Machinery Scope. I'm fortunate uh, to have Aaron Lunt from Mean and Law with us today. I was just hoping to have a little conversation today about um, warranty and in particular in the used equipment market. Um, whether it's ag or construction, um, you know, the used equipment marketplace is uh, something we've been passionate about and we're working on things here at Machinery Scope. But um, I think that there's so much um, value and things that we can learn from you, Aaron. Don't mind, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, absolutely. So thanks, Jake, for this opportunity to you, Machinery Scope. And it's great to be with everybody, spending a few minutes going over topics at a super high level, just expose some of these ideas and concepts to um, to the community, right, in the agricultural community, which is really the backbone of America, right? You harvest our crops and you do all those amazing things throughout the U.S. And so it's always great to be able to contribute in any way, even if it's a small way, to that segment. Again, my name is Aaron Lunt. Um, I'm a shareholder with the law firm of Mean and PA. We are a insurance regulatory law firm, and I'll explain really high level what that all entails. Based out of Tallahassee, Florida, the state capital, we have a national practice from the standpoint that we represent clients essentially in all 50 states, helping them navigate insurance, service contracts, warranties, and all sorts of products um, that would be in that space, automotive, home warranty, consumer goods, and then we are um, active in the agricultural and commercial equipment space as well. I'm originally, I'm a Midwest guy. I'm from the Chicagoland area, born and raised, relocated to Florida just over three years ago, um, and have a, a deep experience in history in this, in this space, and um, really love the opportunity to be able to, to engage with you guys here. Yeah, that's perfect. And I appreciate you taking the time because I think it is a big deal. You know, um, our industry is in a in a unique place We're um, we have been largely a handshake industry, you know, doing business with uh, local people. And when we sell something, we stand behind it. And I think for the most part, this is this is true. But obviously the landscape um you know, is evolving. Um, it, it, it's changing. There's more transactions being done online across states. We never meet people. And so I think we got to just think about some of how we approach um, or represent the warranty or the equipment that we're selling with or without warranty. Um, and so I'm really keen kind of in on the used equipment marketplace again. Um, and so I, I want to start with a story about, <coughs> excuse me, a um, couple weeks back, I got a call on a, in a Friday evening about uh, some gentleman and I'm like, oh shit, here we go. Um, he's like, oh, I bought this tractor and it's out of base warranty and I got problems with it and, you know, looking for guidance or a lot. And of course I'm like, whoa, <laughs> uh, <laughs> First of all, did you did you have our coverage on it? And in this case, he didn't. But I got kind of to the bottom of it. And the long and short of it was, um, at least according to him, uh, he bought this tractor that was just outside of base warranty. That according to him, he's a, the dealer was going to stand behind it. And now they're looking at a major uh, engine failure. And, you know, what... What can he do? <laughs> well, obviously at that point, he needs to go talk to his own attorney, hopefully work it out with the dealer, right? But it gets me thinking like, all right, <clears throat> so how is how are we representing the equipment we're selling as an industry? What mm -hmm. options are we presenting for that equipment buyer um, with, to add some protection? And is it done truly in house as at the dealership? Or excuse me, are you offering some sort of warranty coverage or extended service contract? And I know you're going to explain that in a minute for us. Um, but uh, you know that that's what kind of I'm like man. I I know that our audience can benefit from just talking through some options, maybe some do's and don'ts here um, on on how to offer some peace of mind and protection to help close deals, um, uh -huh. but but doing it the right way. Uh -huh. um, another one I used to see, and I, I think it still happens, you know, guys would do, well, 
if you got a major problem on the powertrain, we'll do 50-50 parts and labor warranty. And that's it. That's There's that notation at the bottom of the purchase order. And it's like, if I would ask like, okay, so what does this mean? What if this, what if that? Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I think um, hopefully there's some value in it for our dealers and our uh, industry friends to just kind of consider how how they might approach it. Um, so a lot to dissect here, Aaron. Uh-huh. Um, but I want to start with this. Many purchase orders will often say something to the effect of uh, th- there's no warranty on used equipment. Implied warranties are not made. They're excluded unless specifically in writing by the seller. <clears throat> what does this mean? What is an implied warranty? Yeah, so Jake, yeah, lots to unpack there. And let me try to, you know, um, take, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time here. And again, there's a lot to be said here, right? Um, Us lawyers, we love to talk, right? And so I'm going to try to do it in a non-verbose way just to kind of get the, you know, my, I'm just issue spotting here. I'm just trying to give everybody a little bit of information on these different issues. And then just to illuminate the legal implications of some of these things, because when I think of a warranty, when I think of a service contract, and we'll talk about that later, you know, usually this is what I see as an attorney. People look at a contract really at two points in time. One, when they're actually entering the contract and not everybody reads every word on that paper. Let's just be honest. You're making a purchase and decision. You're not reading everything in there more, more often than not. You look at it at that time, though, theoretically. And then when you have a problem, right, when there's an issue is the second time you look at it. In between that, you may never look at that thing again. So it's really important to understand what you're warranting, what representations are made, and what's really legally enforceable. And and always, you know, you know, everybody recalls conversations differently. Things might be heard differently. People forget what was said. A representation might be made and that individual graduates onto something else. And so you're trying to figure out what did Bob say or what did Jane say when she made this representation? There's a lot, a parade of horribles, as I like to say, that can flow from that. Um, and again, let's let's be honest, we're talking about um, agricultural equipment here primarily, and that's usually your your lifeblood. That's how you earn an income as, as a farmer or somebody in this space. And so your operational time is critical, right? Whenever every day that that product is down or that device is down, that might directly impact your revenue or that might directly impact your business or your farming operation. So there's a lot of implication. There's a lot of emotions around this. I just want to provide that context. Basically, and there's so much here to unpack, but essentially an implied warranty is basically just just something just as, as the word would indicate, implied. If you buy a um um a uh, electronic hedge trimmer there's an implied warranty that it's going to be capable to trim hedges right it's going to be fit for purpose sometimes you feel like it's fit for uh fit for purpose or the implied warranty of merchantability a lot of that is concepts around it's just going to work as it's intended right but a seller a dealer or whoever can make additional express representations both verbal and in writing that um, you know might represent a little bit something to that potential consumer. Let me give an example. If you go buy a chainsaw, you're going to assume the chainsaw is going to cut wood. But if the consumer says, "Hey, you know, I've got these really thick live oak trees in my backyard that were blown down by a hurricane. I live in hurricane territory, so I get to say that kind of stuff. Is yeah. it going to be able to cut that live oak thick product?" And if the dealer or the seller says, yes, it is, that's more of an express warranty, or at least you're flirting with that area. And there's a representation made to the consumer that, hey, if I buy this chainsaw, it's going to cut that live oak. And so there's express warranties and things like that. I'll just kind of land this point of the conversation, Jake, and see if you have any follow-ups. I I think it's really important, and you're going to have, all lawyers are going to say this, but I think it's very real, and everybody can think of an anecdotal situation. You thought of one, Jake. The more you can reduce to writing is going to be better because then there's going to be a document that you can look at at the time of loss 
that you can kind of memorialize what representations were made. I know we're in an industry where a lot of times there's verb, there's handshakes and there's verbal representations and your word is gold. That's super important. Let's not change it as an industry. But when you're talking about warranties, and you're talking about representations that will cover a loss or not cover a loss at a point in time in the future, whether that's three weeks from now or three years from now, the more that you can reduce to writing so that you remove ambiguity, you remove all those you know misunderstandings of what was represented that time, the better off everybody is going to be. So let me just pause there, Jake, to see if you have any follow up questions on them. Yeah, you know, I think that's perfect. And, and I do. I appreciate how you respect, understand the nature of the industry. And I think that there's still a desire to want to do good, just do goodwill. Our word is good and so on. Um, but I thought you said a key point in there. Um, there can be misunderstandings or I thought I heard this and now time passed and, you know, exactly what that was or whatever. I mean, 99 times out of 100, it comes to pass without issues. Right. But all of a sudden um, <clears throat> on a forage harvester, uh, if we have an engine failure, it's not cheap uh -huh. or high horsepower, you name it. Um, a hundred thousand dollar failure is not uncommon. So we're talking real money. Um, now I think, uh, in, in, in maybe you don't want to, uh, uh, address this. Um, or I understand you're an attorney and you might oh. want to be careful how you address yeah. this. Okay. Sure. Um, Ask away. We'll see how I respond. All right. Ask away. So yeah. I'm selling, um, a, a, a tractor to farmer Bob uh -huh. and I'm like Bob you know that we'll stand behind it and as you mentioned things happen now I, all of a sudden six months later I'm I had this career opportunity I'm gone uh -huh. farmer Bob has an engine failure he comes back to the dealership and says I was told you guys I always dealt with Jake uh -huh. he said he would stand behind it you guys always have, and so that's what I expect. And now, for whatever reason, they're like, well, we don't really do that. And I've seen that happen, too. Salespeople have a certain way of doing kind of their own business within the business. Um, right. And, um, but anyways, what is their obligation from the dealership based off of the words that I expressed assuming that 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 purchase order says somewhere in it that there's no implied warranty or anything else on used equipment. <clears throat> Is there an obligation uh, from a legal perspective, you think, to for that dealership to do something on that repair? You know, um Unfortunately, I'm going to have to give you start out my response with a typical lawyer answer, and that is it depends, Fair. right? I mean, and, and I don't mean that to be glib or to be, you know, to be silly by any stretch of the imagination. It really does depend. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, I would suggest, though, that there's not much that stands behind that comment, right? Because you're going to look at the legal documentation, what's in writing, whether it's a purchase order, whether it's a limited warranty or something else is going to be the primary thing that you're going to look to. Because um, if it's a $100,000 loss and um, you're the one that sold it, Jake, and you've graduated on the new opportunity, and let's say, you know, um, you know, Mary is your replacement person. She's like, I don't know what we meant by that. I don't know what conversations took place. There's just a lot of things. So legally, when you get down to it, there's going to be some problems with enforcing that and interpreting what does that mean? Does that mean we'll stand behind our product, meaning that if you have minor maintenance issues, we'll fix it? Or does that mean if this thing blows up, in your cornfield, right. hypothetically, we're going to replace the three hundred thousand dollar compound. No questions asked. You know, I don't think it means that potentially, but there's just a lot of ambiguity um, that comes. Now, I will say, a lot of companies in this industry, there's reputational harm for those kinds of things, and a lot of times, sure. what I see is dealers, potentially manufacturers, they're going to want to step in and do some sort of goodwill thing that's kind of outside of regards to what the document says. Like, look. As a good business partner, as a brand or as a dealer that has a reputation in this local community, we don't want 
Farmer Bob, I think you used that example, Jake. We don't want him bad-mouthing our organization because he had a bad experience. So there's going to be a lot of reputation or goodwill that's going to step in. But legally, boy, that's really hard to enforce, Jake. Nobody understands what that means. Even did you have an agreement there or did you have a meeting of the minds? That's the fancy way we talk about. Is there an mm -hmm. actual agreement there? What, what did you mean? There's so many. Now, there might be industry practice. There might be other influences kind of help us unpack that. It is a representation, but is it legally forcible? That's going to be the tricky part, Jake. Yeah. And nobody wants to get into discerning those things. Um, so if you don't mind, I, I think... It's a good opportunity maybe for us to shift gears a little bit towards then <clears throat> like what are other options besides just standing behind it as a dealer right um and getting into ex extended service contracts or extended warranty and, and maybe you help us out by just distinguishing those two first yeah great question um jake and we get as a law firm we do a lot of help companies develop products and services, form drafting, making sure it's compliant. We help companies, they'll come to companies will come to us and say, we want to sell this. What is it? How, you know, what is it? How is it going to be regulated? What are the compliance considerations? That's a core thing that we do. If companies need to get licensed to sell certain products, we help with that. So this is kind of core to our business. So let me unpack it this way. So when you're talking about a warranty, right? and you're talking about a service contract, those are kind of distinct things. A warranty, and there's different types of warranty, but let's talk about written warranties now. Um, a warranty, there's no charge for a warranty. We, we say it's the benefit of the bargain. Essentially, that it goes something like this. Come buy my product. Come buy my combine or whatever the commercial equipment is, and I warrant that it's it, it's going to be amazing. It's going to do all these wonderful things. And so it's an incentive for the consumer to buy that product or buy it from a particular dealer because there's a warranty that stands behind it. It's no additional cost. So you don't pay for the warranty. It just kind of comes with the purchase of that product. And it typically covers mechanical failures, key component breakdowns, all those things that could really go wrong with the product. And the, the design of it is, is if this product breaks, we warrant that for a period of time, we're going to fix it. We're going to make sure this thing stays operational. We're going to make sure, you know, that everything is in good working condition with it. That's really what a warranty is. Now, a service contract in comparison oftentimes covers the exact same stuff, the mechanical breakdowns, component failures due to wear and tear or, you know, what have you. But a key distinguishing characteristic is that a service contract is going to be an additional cost. So it kind of, sometimes they're called extended warranties where you have the warranty that the dealer may provide. And typically with the warranty, I'm kind of back in this lane, typically that has to be provided by somebody, what we say is in the chain of distribution. It's either the manufacturer, um, a distributor, or a retailer, which would be the dealer in this situation. They can provide a warranty on a product because they're in a chain of distribution um, at no additional charge. A service contract, it's going to be kind of the same thing, but it's going to be a cost to it. So you would pay X amount of dollars to get this service contract or the extended warranty. And that oftentimes will be offered by a third party company that's not in that chain of distribution. So like a third party company that has um, the ability to sell that. Service contracts are more highly regulated than warranties. Oftentimes you need to be licensed as a service contract provider to be the obligor on the contract. And there's a lot of other implications as what can and can't be in the form with mandatory disclosures. And again, I won't go down too many details, but there's more heavily regulated at the state level. Warranties are typically more lightly regulated. There is a federal law that governs uh, warranties, and sometimes there's additional state laws that you would stack on top of that, but they're very differently regulated in the marketplace. So I hope that's at least somewhat helpful, Jake. Yeah, well, I, I think at, at its core, they're designed to provide some protection against a major failure for that equipment owner, right? That's correct. <laughs> um, now, I got to confess this to you, and maybe this is not advisable, especially if I send this to our entire audience because I'm con confessing. <coughs> um, we will often refer to our coverage as an extended warranty uh -huh. because what people talk about their tractor, um, their you know their used tractor, and they want to get some coverage, they'll refer to it as 
extended warranty. Yep. If I go to Google and say, what are people searching for online? They're not searching for tractor extended service contracts. Correct. Um, Call it a warranty. Yep. So um, we will often refer to it as extended warranty. But what we're really talking is an extended service contract that protects that equipment owner from all the things within that contract. For our coverage, and everyone will do it a little differently, we got a couple different layers of protection, whether it's powertrain or something more. Exactly. Um, exactly. But uh, hopefully I'm not in too much trouble by referring to it as a extended warranty when that tends to be how people recognize it in the, in the marketplace. Yeah, and I would just speak into that a little bit. That's very common, like in the home warranty space, which I know we're not talking about that here. They call yeah. it home warranties, but they're not home warranties. They're home service contracts. Right. That's the status of them under the eyes of the law. But there's just been a culture for years of calling them home warranties. And so the nomenclature in different industries is very different. The other thing I would say from a service contract perspective is a warranty is great if it's in writing because it gives the consumer assurances that they buy this product, I'm going to have certain level of protection for a period of time. An extended warranty, also a service contract, is even more helpful because it extends the life of that warranty at an additional cost that they're going to be taken care of in their time of need. The service contracts how also can be a source of revenue um, if that's desired for people in that chain of distribution because there's oftentimes a cost associated with it. Yes, you've got to pay mm -hmm. the administrator to service that, but there can be a fee that you can charge. So not only does it help keep customers happy in their time of need because you want them to come back to your dealership and buy that next piece of equipment, obviously, you want to keep that ownership experience really positive, but it also can be a, a, a source of revenue for you as you sell these things. I, I don't know what that looks like for your business, but it also can help in that regard too. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there, Jake. Yeah, you know, um, you know, one thing that I'm super passionate about because we farm and we've been in this space. And and again, we're working with all of our, our friends and we're, I'm keenly aware of the value proposition that we can provide. And um, for us, especially in the commercial which, by the way, maybe I'll ask you to distinguish that before I go any further. Commercial extended service contract consumer. Is there a meaningful difference to uh, our equipment dealers or anyone of our equipment owners that might be listening to this? There is. And thanks for bringing that up, Jake. There is an important distinction. So and we can I could talk for days about this stuff. I'm very passionate about, it, as you can tell. Um, service contract laws are largely written for a consumer transaction. So consumer Jake walks into a retail store and buys something for household use or purposes. Some states treat all service contracts, even in the commercial context, as equal, meaning they're just as much regulated as a consumer level contract um, or a consumer purchase. Several states that have service contract laws will have a commercial exemption, meaning if you are a commercial transaction, it could be a business entity that's purchasing a product or it's a product that's designed for commercial use, then you would be outside of the service contract law. So there, each state's a little bit different. It's a little bit hard to navigate. Again, our firm spends oodles and oodles of time nav helping companies navigate this. <laughs> But there is a distinction in several states between the two, Jake. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Well, thanks for offering that. And um, where I was going is one of the things I'm most proud of is um, the we have an extremely efficient risk transfer model. Um, <clears throat> and I realize extended warranty, extended service contracts, they're not for everybody. Uh -huh. Um but I, I think about young farmers trying to get started, you know, that have uh, maybe for cash flow, trying to make sure that they can make their payments and not have that surprise, unexpected $100,000 engine failure. Um, or, or even uh, guys maybe close to retirement that have built a nest egg that don't want to get hit with, you know, something like that in the end. It's an extremely uh, efficient uh risk transfer model for us um and you know i i think it's very much worthwhile for for equipment owners um <clears throat> and then um 
you know, for equipment dealers too, uh, it creates touch points with those with their customer base um, to bring that back to them for servicing. And if there is a failure, getting that that equipment repaired. Exactly. I echo what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know if there's a question baked in there, Jake, but I, I agree with that. I think that's exactly what these things are designed to do. With the Now, there's a lot of bad publicity about service contracts. If you go to Consumer Reports or Consumer Affairs, only the bad people complain to these organizations. But I can tell you, having worked inside for large companies that sell service contracts and now being with a law firm working with the industry, there is millions of dollars flowing out to individuals and other entities in their time of need. So um, there is value in these products and value is being there in your time of need, right? When that product or that person piece of commercial equipment breaks and you got to get it up and running, it's the middle of harvest time, right? You got to get it operational because days that go by are money that's not going into your pocket, so to speak. Uh, companies stepping in in your time of need. There's millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars that's flowing out of these organizations to meet customers, meet entities in their time of need. So there's tremendous value in these. Products. And I'm not suggesting you need to buy these. That's not what my design here is. I'm an attorney. Yeah. I help with the regulatory thing. But I can tell you there's value in these products because I see it on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, extended warranty is not a... Uh, business that i thought when i was 16 or 18 years old man i want to be in the extended warranty business um <clears throat> i as a kindergartner i got to fly to racine wisconsin and see him build tractors uh -huh. uh, i got to uh connect with some really smart people good friends from um the dealership where we farm uh i got to out of college work with the dealership i love the equipment industry uh -huh. um i think there's just a lot of goodwill and as you mentioned i mean it's is um feeding america providing uh -huh. energy for america uh -huh. <laughs> i just got into this space because I'm like, we can do it better. We can mm -hmm. provide better solutions to help equipment owners. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and there's other, there's other companies that do similar things to what we do too, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, check them out as well. Um, but obviously, um, you know, for, for us, um, I, I think the, rooted the, our connection um, to uh, the industry and leveraging some of that to develop the programs that I think are the most worthwhile. I mean, that that's what we're, we get fired up about. We're passionate about that. And, um, and ironically, it actually, that first owner that has warranty on his combine that likes to trade every couple of years, uh, uh -huh. um, we play an important role for him too, because uh -huh. um, we create a, uh, uh, you know, the tools in order to help make those investments digestible for, you know, that second or third owner. And so then we create trade cycles so that, you know, people can invest in technology and grow and, uh, oh. you know, their farming operations and things like that. So anyways, that's, I get fired up about it. I didn't imagine myself in this space, but um, <clears throat> I, I, I think there's incredible value. I agree. Um but again, it is nuanced. I think it's kind of the the the, the key, you know, thing that I think about is, um, you know, you know, us lawyers, we can fight about anything, right? Uh, but we're <laughs> we're mainly a regulatory firm. Our job is to kind of help navigate and remove ambiguity, make sure you uh, have a compliant product, um, so that there's um, clarity for for you and for the consumer in their time of need. And, you know, that's the worst thing is usually when you have a breakdown, um, it's not a good day, right? You, you've already got a problem and to find out that it's not covered on top of it, or there was something said at the time of sale that nobody can recall what was exactly said or was misunderstood, that just exacerbates or makes the problem much, much worse. If there's something in writing that's clear, short as possible. I mean, we're not talking an 82 page document here. If it can be short, concise, clear, you can point to it. Everybody understands what's covered in that time of need. I think everybody wins in that situation. Exactly. I mean, it <coughs> having it spelled out, I think is great. Um, so do you have anything else to add, uh, Aaron, for um, our, our dealer network or equipment owners um, on the topic? 
You know, uh, n- not a whole lot more, Jake. I think we covered a lot of things. Really appreciate this um, opportunity. And, you know, um, you know, our firm gets calls. You know, it's interesting because we're getting more calls, I would say, from the agricultural and, you know, this kind of industry than we've probably ever historically gotten. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think these products are getting way more complicated in a good way, just from all the technology and the, you know, the artificial intelligence. And there's all these uh, different functions and features that they can do. And like some of these things are remote operated, as I understand, there's not even human beings sometimes that are driving these products um, depending on the nature of what it is. And so we're getting more and more calls because as these things get more complicated, there's more things that can break, right? And more things that break mm-hmm. can translate into downtime, which is not good for anybody. So um, yeah, would would love to engage more deeply with the industry. If anybody has any questions, they can reach out to you, Jake, and you know how to put them in touch with me. But um, great industry. This industry is, you know, the backbone of America, as you already alluded to, to Jake. And I think there's just tremendous opportunity to add increasing value in this warranty and extended warranty slash service contract space. So thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely, Aaron. Thank you for sharing all of your uh, knowledge and wisdom. I know you're a very busy man. And uh, again, for this time, and um, I'm I'm Jake with Machinery Scope. You can check us out at machinerioscope.com. Give us a call. Um, we answer our phones. We answer our emails. We're here to serve the industry however, however we can. So uh, thank you all. And uh, again, Aaron, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Jake.